Uh, welcome everybody to the BIM Tube podcast. My name is Stephen. Today I've got John with me. So John Nordcliffe, who's my guest today. So welcome, John. Hello. Hello. Hi. How are you? Very good. Thank you. Good. And welcome. Uh, we know each other um, uh, for, for not so long, but we work very closely aligned, I would say. So it's really uh, great to have you here. And it would be really great to to get your insights on obviously digital data and for the benefit of people that haven't watched or listened to one of these before, even though it's called BIMTube and we know all about BIM, the BIM in this context stands for Better Information Management. We may talk about the other meaning of BIM because that is part of what we both do. But John, before we go on, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself, what you do currently, and just very briefly for those, particularly if they're earlier in their career, just to you know, to show them that everyone has a different path, what, how you started your career and how you got to where you are now. So over to you, John. Thanks for having me. Uh, um, so my name's John and I founded um, Reddit Architects nearly five years ago now. Um, and then prior to that, I've worked for lots of different types of architectural practices for just over... 20 years, dare I admit. Um, large practices, small practices, mostly in London and also abroad. I had a, a stint of four years uh, working in Bermuda. So I've got some experience of what is a very Americanized system uh, over there. Um, and along the way, I think I've been quite lucky really. Uh, when I started, it was still pens and drawing boards and T squares. Uh, and then the uh, advent of 2D CAD drawing came along, uh, which was very much sort of my era, I guess, as I was beginning to qualify and I was having to draw lots of details and deadlines and everything else. Um, and then, again, a scary long time ago, nearly, uh, I'd say, 15 years ago, probably, I started to get exposed to the idea of 3D modelling and BIM. Uh, the practice I was working for at that time in London uh, had just bought some Archicad licences. Um, they could have bought Revit. It would have been the same journey, ultimately, I think. Um, and um, we just started using it. And it was just uh, game changing, basically. So ever since then, I've become very interested in the idea of um, 3D modeling very much as a design tool, but also as a way of coordinating information, making sure that everything stays tight, um, which is one of our main roles as an architect. We, we are responsible for taking lots of different packages of information that are often half developed or just developing or sometimes a consultant hasn't been hired yet and so we have to make assumptions and then they come along later and we have to very rapidly incorporate all of their data and in the old days it would involve lots and lots of checking um, that that person's plans match that person's elevations and you would have literally situations where buildings are being erected not on our projects obviously where there are more windows on the plans than there are on the elevations which is just insane but uh, was a real problem and when you get down into the real minutiae of millions and millions of different components uh, which is becoming ever the increasing problem now I say problem buildings are becoming more sophisticated um, I think it's almost impossible to or I wouldn't want to attempt to try and uh, achieve good results using 2D anymore. It just has to be 3D all the way. So um, having worked for several practices using 3D BIM, it got to the point where I was at a point in my career where I thought I could do this, I could I could set up on my own. And, and that was, again, fantastic because it enabled me to wipe the slate clean and I could take all the best elements of and all and be wary of all of the worst things about all the practices I've worked um, for in the past and just cherry pick the best bits. So um, that's what we have been trying to do as a practice. Um, we're Norfolk based and we're up to five people. And um, as a result, we work as a very, very tight knit team and we very much follow the sort of principle of spending five hours to save five minutes. So if there's a, a problem that we're trying to solve, we really work hard to try and keep every package of information or information flow as streamlined as possible and centralized within ideally one central 3d bim model so um in terms of getting going and practice i think very similar to lots of other people who start an architectural career 
you don't really know where you're going to start. And I think there's a lot of luck that, that comes into that. Um, I was fortunate to, um, uh, having studied in London, to have been hired by Purcell Architects, uh, who back in the day were, had loads of projects with historic royal palaces and lots of different interesting conservation projects. So um, I, I just thought that was just the most incredibly lucky thing ever, really. So um, I was immediately exposed to some pretty high profile and famous buildings, um, but it became very apparent very quickly that it doesn't really matter what the building is, the problems are the same. There are the same issues around delivery and detail and ensuring that everything is compliant, et cetera, et cetera. So um, uh, over my career, I've worked on uh, boutique hotels, historic buildings, sheds, restaurants, and quite a lot of, um, I would say, specialist or high-end residential projects, which again involve lots and lots of detail and lots and lots of coordination. Um, and now as a practice, um, I think we're on a similar path, really. We have a very, very diverse uh, portfolio. If you look on our website, lots and lots and lots of different types and scales of projects. Um, but every single project is modeled in 3D fully and all the information flows through one central point. Um, and then other things have come along. So I think um, uh, rendering has become fantastically sophisticated now. It's now possible to create incredible visuals straight from the 3D model. So you're not having to redraw and go back again. Uh, and then when virtual reality came along, we worked out a way of plugging the goggles into the same 3D model. So again, one model into another piece of software briefly, but not edited just so we can output uh, into VR and clients love it. And so do, so do contractors. We've been able to price jobs or contractors have by walking around our buildings with a pair of goggles on. They can see straight away where some challenges may uh, occur in the future and they might make a suggestion. Why don't you move the wall over there slightly or if we introduce a column, this is gonna be much more effective and we can take on board all of that data. We don't always agree with them, but at least everyone is, is far more aware of the design as a whole. Um, but most importantly, I think the clients are far better uh, able to understand what a project is likely to give them at the end. So it, the technology just keeps getting better. There's just more and more joining up of different elements now. And then uh, I, probably what we're going to touch on later on, the ability to put information into a 3D model is, I think, the next frontier. It's already here, but being able to analyze the amount of carbon, energy loss, cost analysis, all, all of this becomes far easier if the data is kept in the right spot. So um, in the old days, you would um, print things out and put things in a filing cabinet. Now you take them out of the filing cabinet and you scan them in, you put them back into your computer. The BIM model is in a sense, the new filing cabinet for not only the uh, team who will help build the building, but once it's finished, the building gets handed over to the client who has to manage it. And if it's a big project like a school or a university, uh, the old system is a load of blue folders in the basement. If you want to find your information, you've got to go down there and, and cycle through it all. Now it's possible to click on an element of the building and call up the information. So we're very interested in that. And we're trying to really, really push that more and more to the, to the fore. Thanks, John. I mean, yeah, we, we've got some. So thank thank you for that, for the, for the overview. And then you gave some examples and we will come back with obviously have in mind what we might touch on. But just, I guess, taking it back to like the highest level, you talked about challenges or problems with information just at a, like a very high level like without detail because we'll get into the detail what was sort of the top three challenges that you still see just generally around the management or mismanagement or the lack of information it's, are there a top top three like it's missing or it's not um, handed over just well just in terms level. of in terms of process uh, in in the bit of the building stage i think particularly with larger projects, there's quite some way to go with the education of the client to allow them or, or help them to appoint their team in the right way. I think that's the biggest problem for us. Um, and a brief example of that would be a, a building services engineer. They might be hired to do a very high level performance spec for the equipment that goes in the building. Um, and that's fine, but it would be so helpful if we had, or they were allowed to go a little bit further with that design so that we can start putting the boxes 
in the space because inevitably what will happen is the performance spec will turn into a one meter by one meter massive duct that's going right the way through your living room, for example, quite an extreme example there. But um, it happens on, on larger projects. So that, that's one problem, getting the team hired in the right way. Um, people changing their mind is fine, but also problematic. So again, if everyone understands what that we're doing and they can sign it off sooner, they're less likely to change their mind later. Nobody likes to pay a whole team of consultants to redo things because it's it's dead money. It's just abortive work. Um, but sometimes that's necessary because a team member has been hired too late, which is another blurring of the two issues. Um, and then sort of in terms of managing data generally, um, it's quite difficult. It's not, I mean, it it's hard, but it's worth spending the time to get all of the information through one centralized model often a shortcut is taken so a schedule of i don't know electrical components or whatever else will end up on a on a spreadsheet so it's not integrated now so we've got to manage the spreadsheet and we've got to manage the model which shows where all of those elements will go and they have to be coordinated with other things so it becomes a spider's web that just gets harder and harder to sort of untangle so keeping it all channeled is uh, is definitely the key yeah. Yeah, th thanks, John. I mean, w one of the sort of set topics that or theme questions that we might come to, and I'll I'll introduce it now if I can, because it's building on that. Is um, one of the things I was going to ask is what is one of the most effective methods to promote collaborative working? Because um, we've, we've you're sort of touching on that directly, but I didn't know if you've got anything to add on that. So you know, one of the effective methods, and how do we sort of make software more user friendly? That's very specific, I guess, but elaborating on what we're talking about. Well, I mean, there's, I mean, a 20 year old initiative was to try and get through various BIM levels. I know the language has changed in, 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 in latter years. So uh, the dream was, particularly on a very large infrastructure project, for example, everybody would be using the same combination of layers and systems so that it can easily be federated into one mega project. Um, that's just really hard to do. Um, every consultant, um, has put a fee together to deliver a job in a certain way. If they have to add a whole load of extra complication to store their information on uh, a, a sort of separate system that they're not used to or a different series of layers and combinations and things like that, it just gets harder and more expensive. Uh, your team may not be trained or able to do that quite so well. So I think that's where we can make or maybe work collaboratively in a, in a more effective way. I think technology makes it possible now to allow everyone to work independently in their own way. Uh, what we would do, for example, as architects, is we would take all of the structure engineers information, drop it into our 3D model, and we'll just assign it a color, very simple color coding. So everything from the structure engineer is green, and everything from the building services engineer would be, say, orange. So then in 3D, we can fly through the building and spot the clashes in a meeting environment. So it, that's so collaborative but it, because it means that every single person can see where the challenge lies. Quite often you'll get egos in, in, in a team. So one person has just finished a whole load of work. The last thing they want to do is edit their drawings, uh, but so the other guy's in the same position. So, but if you can show the challenge in 3D and if it's obvious that maybe the beam moves over a bit to make room for the ducts, then uh, everyone's Everyone's up for that. Everyone understands what the challenge is so we can move forward. So um, those sort of low tech or, or um, meeting based screen sharing approaches to collaborative design are really, really effective. And in terms of the legals, later on after the meeting, everybody goes back to their own office. They edit their own drawings and then they issue them formally later and we'll do a final check. And nine times out of 10, it's all coordinated. But it means that the client has a reassurance that each team has produced their own drawings in their own way. It's been properly revised and recorded. So there's no misunderstanding as to who is responsible for moving that thing. It's only the person who can move that thing, the beam or the uh, ducts or the wall in our case. So it makes it clearer, I think. And I think that gets, builds confidence in the team gradually and it makes it more collaborative uh, generally. Uh, yeah, thanks, John. I mean, what you touched on there is like the roles and responsibilities, which is always, of, I mean, it's part, obviously it's part of what we do, but I think I think that's the interesting 
uh, conversation it depends who you talk to now the implication is obviously i work with technology type people i am on myself and often that role responsibility the word collaboration isn't the typical language set and just for the benefit of people listening or watching there is this cliched but very still worthy concept in more pure it and information management people process technology which i'm sure everyone's heard and when you're talking you're mentioning the technology but then it's the people and that you were just talking about the people in the process i mean that's that's always the missing or can be the missing part can't it which you that's all that's the the harder part to get right the technology is is easier have you, have you got have you got anything to just add to that about the process challenges um well i think the technology is here now i, I think we've got to a stage where each professional is uh, um, outmatched by the software that they already have in their office. I, I don't think there are many practices where they are lacking in, in, in the software. It's all there. We just haven't figured out what all the buttons do yet. You know, that, that seems to be the sort of overarching kind of uh, um, uh, thing that we come across. So, um, so that's not the issue. So therefore, the process is people. Um, um, I think that Buildings are so complicated now, um, and we have a massive skills challenge now. The, the average age of a construction worker, I think, is, is in their late 50s, uh, they say. Um, new people entering the market are not entering at the rate that we need. So we're, we are gradually going to run out of skills people, both in terms uh, of um, design professionals, but also the people who are actually going to be building these buildings. So. As a design team, we've got to be really clear, firstly, that we can work together very well to make sure that the building, which is complicated, is at least as buildable as it can be, because there are going to be far fewer experts on site who can actually build it. So um, it's a, a, an exercise in simplifying everything directly against a challenge of buildings becoming more and more and more complica complicated. They're becoming more airtight. They've got far more pieces of kit that are embedded within them, et cetera, et cetera. There are more compliance uh, and standards um, uh, levels that we need to meet. So um, it, it's definitely a challenge. So I think the good news is that the technology is there. We just need to really embrace it and rather than working in silos, uh, we have to work far more collaboratively by just using simple shareable platforms and, and trying to move slightly further away from mm. endless um, standards and regulations. It's it's more about the, the chat in the room, I think, and recording what was agreed clearly. That, that seems to... Um, that's my opinion anyway. <laughs> Not everyone might share it. Well, no, I completely agree. And, and in plain English, I mean, the... the Obviously, there's domain experts, and that's why they're there, engineers and architects and lots of others. But it it is interesting, isn't it, the s semantic difference, the, the meanings of whether it's a, a physical asset or information. Have you, have you got an ex example of, of that, just an anecdote around where, again, you don't need to name company names, but of where maybe there's been a misinterpretation, it might, not, it might even be a second hand, of where it's unclear what's been talked about between different parties so um i think uh I, I, we have uh one project uh which was it was a fairly large and complicated uh design and build project so for those that don't know there were different types of building contracts uh and there are different um levels of responsibility and risk that occur using the in the procurement method that you choose to to procure the building so for, for many larger projects the client wants to push much more of the risk onto the contractor uh, by letting the contractor develop and collaborate with them so it's a very collaborative process the downside is is not everything is figured out so um, going back to a building services example we had a situation where um, technically the engineer had figured out that everything should fit within the room all of the pieces of kit should fit in the room but they'd only produced a performance spec so when it came to the uh the uh building uh, stage of the contract um the contractor had the performance spec and had to fit some equipment which just had to meet that particular specification in the room and they said they couldn't. So um, the battle was, uh, well, who's right? You know, uh, the engineer who's designed it all says, well, it should fit. There's no problem. The contractor is like, well, 
come and have a look you know we can't make all of this kit fit in there so um that that causes a problem and and the the result was the room had to be made bigger which means there was one less room available for that hall's residents for the clients who rent out so there was a financial impact direct financial in, uh, uh, impact on the client who had lost effectively a hotel room because of the fact that the plant room would not fit so um that could have been entirely avoided if the room had been designed fully in 3d because it would have been apparent right from the beginning uh, that it did fit and therefore the contractor had to figure it out or vice versa it didn't <laughs> and therefore they would have had to redesign it so um that's one example i can think of off, off the top of my head but that's it's cool. just degrees of that really just on bigger or smaller scales yeah and and, and it's it's at that scale isn't it where it there are benefits, obviously, at single building level to, to look at new ways of working and digital sort of solutions that we've got. But it's at that massive scale, isn't it? And I, I think without these examples, so thank you for sharing an example, I think it's hard for people to imagine some of the savings or some of the benefits. And one of the other things, and I mean, you've already addressed it with, with that example, but one of the set questions I was going to ask is, how can we expand these collaborative tools um, to make them more user friendly in the real world? Now, you've touched on VR, AR. Are, are there any other examples of how, how do we get the capabilities into people's hands or make them more accessible? I know everything we've been talking about is that ultimately, but is there anything else specifically you wanted to add? Um, I think um, what I'm very interested in, what we're looking at as a, as a practice, is embedding uh, the data that we can embed into a model much sooner. So that helps the client understand the benefit at an earlier stage. So one example might be um, you might own an old factory building and you've got a pretty good idea that if you put a load of insulation around it, you would save money because the energy bills would drop but you don't really know how much the insulation is going to cost and you don't know how quickly the payback will be um, and quite often you you might be a middle manager so you have to report to your board to justify whether that work should be carried out or not so um, we're supposed to be getting every single building we see around us down to net zero ideally as quickly as possible but you know by 2050 at least so how are we going to do that unless um, clients can make the judgment call sooner it could be that maybe that building uh should be taken down it could be saved so there's another big question now around uh, embodied carbon do we do we demolish or, or do we retain uh and how do you get those quick answers so what we're looking at is um as we from the very very early stage of concept uh can we embed data into the fuzzy model that hasn't been fully resolved yet just to get some rough sort of trajectories it does is this an idea that might be worth pursuing then the client can understand what's possible and what the digital model can do for them they're more likely hopefully to invest in a team to properly interrogate and build the model properly so as the detail gets more and more enhanced a bit like a pixelated image becoming clearer you are um you're going to get more accurate data and so you can make more refined decisions more quickly and more effectively i think and they involve lots of different consultants. So um, all of the consultants need to get on board on that uh, with that approach um, uh, together. Um, you talked about how we sort of persuade people to do it. I, I think maybe one way is just to show the benefits. You know, if we can sort of act as a sort of uh, exemplar to demonstrate how this is possible, if it's almost coming out of the process automatically, which it doesn't, but it can nearly do, then that means that we don't have to charge loads of extra fees to work these answers out. So therefore it becomes more cost effective and um, hopefully as a practice will become more successful because people will come to us because we can do it. But it also shows that what is possible and it will hopefully um, give clients more confidence to take a more sort of BIM led uh, approach because they will then know that their initial hunches have been backed up by a rough idea followed by more data and then they know it was a right idea and, and they haven't wasted a load of time so i think that's how you it's either carrot or stick i mean regulations obviously as epc standards raise um 
clients will have to upgrade their buildings. They won't have any choice because otherwise they won't be able to let them out. Um, so that's that's the stick, which does work very well. But in terms of carrots, um, we're very interested in doing it. We don't have any inquiries. No one asks us for this. You know, we're, we're just trying to figure it out because we're trying to offer it. Um, we, we, that's not true. In, in the residential sector, homeowners are very interested in retrofitting their homes. They can see the benefit clearly. But commercial clients, we get very few inquiries um, uh, around those kinds of issues. Um, I think it's a, possibly a kind of musical chairs sort of uh, um, uh, stage we're at in terms of our net zero journey. Everyone owns various different types of buildings. And I think they're probably thinking, should we just sell this? Should we move it on? But sooner or later, someone's going to be left with the building that has to be fixed. So they will need the tools to work out how to fix it more rapidly. But they might not, they, they might adopt these decisions or these approaches sooner if they just knew the costs involved or ideally the, the savings that they could benefit from. Um, and, and I also think that um, it feels like there's a growing appetite from clients um, who um, want to have good social governance. Um, if you're a university or a college, for example, your student body will demand that you 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 do the right thing. That you know what what is what is the net zero journey? How are they going to turn their campus into into net zero uh, as quickly as possible? So um, there are discussions around that level. So I think the the academic world uh, and the education sector are, are much more interested. But pure commercial, you know, building owners, understandably, they um, they're worried about the costs. So we've got to try and help prove that it may not be so bad. It, it's a good point, and it, and also you you described it as sort of musical chairs. It's the total cost of ownership is own is a different concept on its own, isn't it? A lot of people don't look at the long term strategic uh, multiple property or portfolio level because that's just not what they do. So I think you mentioned earlier on, perhaps one of the other questions I asked you about education. I still think it all comes back to that, doesn't it? About awareness and education, just being aware what's possible um i i mean do you i guess just building on that do, i mean what do you think we can do and i know you've probably already partly addressed this but have you got anything to add about how we do educate people towards sustainable design towards that net zero so i know that was sort of what we were talking to there but what else could we do i guess is what i'm asking um well the the journey to net zero is um th there are many sides to this so um the most i mean this is the sort of uh, fairly commonly uh, trusted out example the greenest building is the building that already exists so um clearly retrofit is the answer um uh, building new buildings of course they should be incredibly energy efficient um, you can achieve benefit or passive house standard building which doesn't really require any heating at all it's it's just warm enough, you know. Um, they, they say if you own a small dog, the heat that emit, is emitted from the small dog is enough to heat your entire home. So, for new builds, that's relatively straightforward. It's it's uh, complicated, but it, it can be done, and it should be done. For old buildings, it's quite tricky. Um, you know, we've got a rich uh, heritage of, of beautiful listed buildings. How are we going to upgrade them? Are we going to put insulation on the outside, which is easier, but it's going to look different? Or do we put it on the inside, which is technically more difficult, but you're going to have to rip out all of the lovely cornices and features and everything else. So it, it's it's tricky, isn't it? Um, can we find a better uh, source of green energy so we don't perhaps alter the list of buildings? And I think that is the answer. Um, and we just heat them with green energy and we just accept that those buildings will not be as efficient uh, thermally. Um, but at least they're staying up and at least they're going to be uh, used for longer. Um, adaptation is another big thing, which is kind of more, I guess, our world in terms of architecture. How can we take an old building and find a new use for it? What can we do to it? But most of those examples will require some form of alteration or demolition. Um, what's it made out of? That's another big question. So we can work out the life cycle of uh, the building as a whole. We can also work out and break down the building into elements. So how long does a roof last? How long do walls last? How long do foundations last? We can work out how much carbon is embodied within those elements. So all, all of that needs to be considered um, when you're trying to um, work out the best thing to do with a 
a problem building, a building that doesn't easily convert into something else. Um, whereas we often focus on individual elements, for example, thermal performance. It's like, that's it. How much heat does it, it does it lose? Is this the only thing we're, we're worried about? It is an important factor, but there are so many other elements and things to consider in the round also. And I think it's just too confusing for clients, you know, that they're just thinking, you know, this is just too, too much. All I wanted was an extension, you know. <laughs> so we've got to try and, in a sense, uh, using Apple as an analogy, you don't worry about how it works. We're just going to give you the data that you need. We'll try and work out ways as a, as a professional um, uh, construction team of, of consultants. We'll just give you the good data. So it, it could almost be as simplistic as, it's you know it's a seven out of ten you know i mean what, what does the data matter you know that, to a degree i think it's about the trend and it's about the overarching should i knock it down should i keep it what's the payback how am i going to pay for that how am i going to explain that to my board and how, how am i going to get buy-in those are the sort of human desires that the the client most clients have they're trying to work out what they should do and i think everybody wants to do the right thing it's just difficult and it could be possibly too expensive um so um i think as a as a architect uh, my job is not to um you know judge whether something should or is or isn't right i think i should just try and give the client the best advice that i can and just help them through their decision making process but it, it is their building so it's kind of uh, you know you've got to do the moral right thing, but at the same time we're, we're not the um, we're not the arbiters of taste either. You know some clients you try your best to make a really beautiful building, but if they want to put the um, hideous curtains in afterwards, it's it's their house, isn't it? That's that's not for mm. me to decide or, or judge really at all. It, it's interesting what you say about the cladding. Obviously, there's um, which, which I wasn't necessarily going to touch on, but we, I mean we could talk about things like the Fire Safety Act as well. Obviously, there's pros and cons for all different methodologies of doing this. But how, do you see the, and I'll put a link to anything we mentioned for the benefit of people listening or watching, do, have you seen a, a different type of conversation in the wake of the, the Fire Safety Act? Uh, so for the benefit of people listening or watching, this came about in the wake of the Grenfell's tower disaster and the one of the things that is directly relevant to this podcast and why i'm mentioning it they describe something called a golden thread which um again you can describe that if you want john but back, coming back to information and this is legislation so how, are, are people talking about it is is that one of the um mandates that can make change um well th this is um it's an act it's law um so um as a professional i mean all, all members of the construction and client teams who, who own buildings have their own roles and responsibilities with regards to the building safety act um one of the goals uh, or objectives of the act is to inst uh, introduce the the idea of the golden thread so each building all the key information that is absolutely crucial to the running and maintenance and safety of the building is somehow retained with it um and it could be that that is a filing cabinet with lots of folders inside it that that could be the answer and it's locked and it's kept safe and so anybody who needs to know about how the building was constructed when they want to alter it can refer back to that information to make sure that the later decisions or alterations or cladding to use Grenfell as an example doesn't have catastrophic effects obviously so the golden thread should hopefully um, um, hopefully eliminate those risks going forward that's what everyone is is really hoping for um, so again using the filing cabinet which seems to be a regular uh, theme uh, in this uh, in this conversation where does the information live so it could live again within the 3D BIM model. And I think that would be quite a sensible place to keep it. Um, this model or the use of BIM models is likely to stick around. I think everyone agrees that it's a very sensible way of designing buildings. Um, more and more and more buildings will be, as we go forward, built using BIM. And so therefore it would be sensible to develop the, the vault or the, the, the filing system in the right way uh, and 
there will gradually uh, there isn't a standard way of doing this yet but there will be over time and people will gradually adopt and align it'll be a bit like um vhs and betamax we don't know what the system will be yet but it doesn't matter really as long as it is a system and it works so um that i think is again uh, something that's natural for bim i think bim really should be able to kind of uh, help with um the golden thread and it should help the des design teams of the future to not make horrific mistakes going forward you know um uh, buildings are complicated and they will be even more complicated in the future um so how do we adapt them many technologies will have um, become redundant so how do we avoid redundancy and those kind of questions will be interesting as well so um yeah. it's good sorry john go ahead you're finishing no, I think I have finished. I'm trying to work out another another sort of uh, thing to add on to the golden thread, but it's uh, it's incredibly important. It's essentially storing the information the right way. Um, we can already store lots of information, so why not join the two up? I think, and if anything, we can hopefully use the Building Safety Act as another way of hopefully promoting BIM and uh, data management in a more effective way for other uses as well. For example, running your buildings or maintaining them. So that could be another way of linking into that perhaps. Yeah, great. Th thanks, John. I know the, the golden thread, again, for people not familiar, I'll link to some materials, something called the UK BIM framework. We do mean BIM as in building information modeling. Um, if people are in the UK, that's, and if you're not, it's aligned with the ISO 19650 series of international standards where, of course, this is a great way to actually do it. This is what they're for. They provide that framework, but it's it's a bit like where I keep saying framework. People, something needs to go in the framework. Like people need to know. I mean, it, uh, it's probably what we've already been touching on. But I, pe the clients ultimately and others need to know what the questions are to ask. So, there's a, obviously technology is important, information is important, data is important. However, at some simplified level, people need to know the questions to ask, don't they? Now, <laughs> have you got anything to, to add about that, about real time? I know this takes things in a completely different dimension for some. What kind of things are clients asking for in real time or what should they be asking for? So real time data feeds, for example, and reports. Um, I think that, that very few clients are asking those sorts of questions. Um, normally when we meet um, new clients, we'll, we'll show them example projects that we're using and the, the methods that we're using and they're often quite surprised that there's a 3d model you know oh, i didn't realize you know i thought it was just plans you know so um i think in in many markets it's it's very early doors obviously for larger um projects people are a, a bit more switched on um i think in the in the education sector where we're working uh where the arena we're working at um, particularly at the moment um it, it's about this governance piece you know um it's the responsibility of the, the the governors of the institution to have a plan and they often have written the plan so how do you adopt that plan how do you embed that into your um ecosystem um and i think for new builds People have a rough idea of what to do. They commission a new building that you can set it up to the latest standards. You can you can set a target of BREAM excellent. You can you can make all these different uh, decisions early on, which is great. The bigger issue is the existing buildings that they already own, the massive campus that's next door to the one new building that you're building. What are you going to do with all of those uh, older buildings? These 1960s, 50s buildings, 40s. They're all built from very uh, different, there are different methods of construction, different challenges that are associated with them. Um, but uh, that's the challenge, it's learning uh, or educating the benefits of going back through your back catalogue and embedding or modelling your existing buildings and then putting the data in and then being able to make wider, better decisions around all of the assets that you own and how you manage those globally. Um, uh, I guess one example might be being able to have all of your air conditioning units or, or I don't know, some universities, they must have several square miles of carpet tiles, for example, you know, where is all that data? How do they know how much they've got? Do they know how long it lasted? Do they know how to repair it? All of that kind of stuff. Um, we think that if they have a reasonably organized um, spreadsheet, 
we can mirror that. So what, what I think another problem with adoption is you don't want to have all of your eggs in one basket. You don't want to hire one consultant who has the monopoly on your entire estate, all of that data. That's too risky. You know, that company could go could go bust at any moment. So or they'll charge you a fortune to maintain it. I don't think that's the route. I think, you know, let's work with what the client systems are and work out a way of mirroring or updating information back to their existing asset system, whether it's sophisticated or, or quite simple. Um, so that's possible now. You, you can create a, a, a schedule and pull the data the other way back into the 3D model. So I think that is quite a clever way of doing things. It could be as simple as a link. You can have all of your information stored in a secure Dropbox file with a link and they could give us the link and we could place it in the appropriate spot within the 3D model so that if you're trying to find your air conditioning unit, you could tap on the link and it will take you to the right spot. So this is really about finding the stuff. It's not more sophisticated than that. But I think because it's such a massive task, that's what's putting off lots of people or, or um, making them defer the decision for another year. They might yeah. have retired by then, so let's leave it to the next guy. So um, trying to make it quicker and easier, I think, will we'll speed up the adoption process, hopefully. Yeah, good, great. Thank you. I mean, the point you made there, it could just be a link. I think that's where people assume it has to be something highly sophisticated and autom fully automated, but there are steps. There are fa there are phases, aren't there? Sort of a lot of the work I do is, well, there are steps to, to take, and there's a fitness for purpose, you know, things like a uh, when we say link for the benefit of people listening and watching we literally mean a url just a link yeah uh, not linked data for those that are te technical we don't actually mean that but and and like you like you mentioned consuming a spreadsheet of course having a systems information background if you say spreadsheet then i get cold chills up my back but that's often where we start you know that's the source material and uh, i just think in the spreadsheets and consuming them I was just thinking of Kobe, uh, for the benefit of people that aren't familiar, which is a schema, and then there's IFC, which is uh, another schema. Do, do they get talked about a lot with clients? Or uh, I'm just talking about open standards, I guess. Or do do clients ask a lot for proprietary? What kind of formats do basically? Yeah, they they, they will ask. They will ask for Kobe. I think it really depends on. Um, to be honest, I think it boils down to what they've heard of. Um, I, I don't know if you interrogated the client as to why they had chosen a particular sort of standard or schema that they were adopting, whether they would know what the other one was. Um, quite frankly, I'm not sure I would either. Quite frankly, you know, you know, we can uh, mm. import those into our software, so um, we can work yeah. with any. That's fine. So, um, using a very old example um, for a, a large um, university based in London we had to comply with their CAD manual. So we were producing a BIM model, which um, they had to ultimately convert back into a series of um, 2D DWG plans and, and information. So we, we, we managed to do that. We, we wrote a code so that all of the lines that were on um, particular line weights would convert back into AutoCAD, which uses colors for thicknesses. Um, so they were able to create and file their 2D DWG drawings in the color scheme and, the, and all the layer combinations that or um, layers uh, such as would be back then um, perfectly well. So it, it, that's not a block. I think um, if, if a particular um, um, standard or, or, or approach becomes dominant, everyone will align with that and that's mm. fine. Um, it's just getting going really. So, um, you know, IFC is very handy for moving information from one uh, profession to another, for example. So uh, often we will export our model to a structure engineer. They will take their information in as an IFC. They'll delete all the stuff or, that they don't need to get the structure in and then they'll sort of send it back to us and then we'll use another code to bring it back into our, our platform. So um, there, that's more sort of, sh I find that as more of a, a sharing um, approach. Um, but to be honest, it's a few phone calls with the the person in the other office just to work out how to to agree the standards and which which settings to make and you're done then that's locked in and someone writes it down and then it works very well so um it shouldn't be a block or intimidating i i, I don't think 
I, I completely, I completely agree with you. I mean, and for the benefit of people listening and watching, that I have seen Kobe for, are for that. They're for sharing and getting it in another system. And again, that's where people sort of lose their way and start focusing on the actual because ex it's their exchange formats exactly as you articulated. That's what they are. They're for ex moving data information from one system to another and then doing something in the other system not <laughs> that's what they're, they're for and I, I again but people need to know the questions like you've like you've been talking about it's like well, people need to know what to ask for what the questions are what the benefits are why they would be asking for this in the first place and I still think yeah that there's there's a way to go I mean we you know we're coming toward the end of our, our time together unbelievably but what 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 do you see as let's say the top one or two things challenges that we still need to overcome perhaps you've already mentioned them perhaps it's something else so if we could not necessarily wave a magic wand but if we could say influence government mandate or some something else to try and get the industry uh, AEC industries to change with regard to managing information for the whole life of buildings for example what 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 do you think we could you know what's the big blocker at the moment I think starting in the right place. So um, we always recommend with, to to any client get a good survey. Just just whatever it is that you've got your existing building, get a really really good measured survey so we know exactly what it is. Um, then often we will model the survey into the three D model, but over time more and more survey companies will model their own three D model. So if we can standardize that approach that's going to really help because so much information can be built into the elements of the model already so when we inherit or have built the model ourselves we have put the right data in so we know a lot about the existing building straight away that would be my top top tip really you know invest in very good survey data and take the time to create a very detailed 3d model of your existing building because then you'll know how to adapt it if you want to build something else, but that's often seen as too big an investment because you mm. only want to make a minor adjustment at this point. What they don't realize is it could help you manage your entire assets. You, you could find uh, all of your operation and maintenance manuals. You can plan for um, redundancy. You can phase the project. There are so many things that you um, uh, can interrogate from that model and produce schedules from. Uh, I think that would be the the top tip. I think. Great, thank you. There'll be individuals I know at RICS and uh, CICS <laughs> and other industry bodies that are pleased that your one of your yes. takeaways is get a good survey. I can uh, I would certainly agree with a background in geospatial. But uh, and again, maybe an auxiliary question. I'm like personally interested as well, not to put you on the spot here, but are there stand? I mean, when when you you procure on behalf of the client a survey, are there standards do do they do you just get what the survey company give you or are there standards that you point to as an architect i genuinely wouldn't know well we we normally ask uh, we we actually prefer a 2d survey plans and elevations because then we can model the building ourselves um uh, and then we will hazard a guess as to uh what the build-up of the wall is we've normally got a pretty good idea it's either solid brick or it is you know block or whatever else so um we will then embed the data ourselves there isn't really a standard i wish there was you know so uh i mean you, okay you will you will require levels uh, a degree of accuracy that everyone understands uh, 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 it should be located on the planet the correct spot so that all of your sun path data and everything else will work and everything else so um in short, I feel like we're quite at the beginning beginning stages of this, and I know that many survey companies could produce a huge amount of extra detail and add a, a layer of um, usability um, if they were just asked for it and, and probably paid for it. I think that's probably the other problem. So understanding the true cost and the true value are, are two different things that clients need to um, embrace as well. Yeah, and and just just a quick yes or no, because and I'll link to other people. Do, are N N R M codes they asked for? I don't know what an N R M code okay, is. No, no. <laughs> New rules of measurement. No, no. They're, so they're, oh, they are specific to R I Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors, and they're to describe 
anyway methodology of doing it but that but yeah. that's the interesting thing isn't it where i'm obviously i'm not an architect i know more about measured survey and things but that's where it's really interesting the different domains i know i keep bringing this point up but i think the bigger challenge is just the, exactly that case and that's why i asked it just some of the jargon some of the terminologies mm -hmm. just are not known you know the infinite things that you could mention from an architectural background that i won't know what they are you describe and i go well, yeah, okay yeah, <laughs> do, yeah you, exactly. do, you, do you see that yeah. still I, I know i asked you this kind of earlier but it, it, it's, it's constant the, the the honestly a pair of not that expensive uh virtual reality goggles has proved pay for itself i don't know a thousandfold every client puts them on the novelty of wearing goggles wears off in about three seconds they're they're immediately focusing on their new house and the fact that if the window was moved to the right a bit you'd have a lovely view of the tree outside because we model all the trees outside so just the sort of human uh, uh act of looking around allows you to engage completely um, and then the builder can price it, and then the structure engineer walks around it and says, ah, oh, that would make it more logical if the beams were in this particular location. Everyone can immediately connect with it. So I think th making the process simpler uh, is possible because we are, after all, modeling it in three dimensions. So we've gone to all this trouble to make this 3D model. Let's not make it all about data and those are dry stuff. Let's try and make it about making the building look beautiful and respectful to the area and uh secure and safe uh, and everything else and um people can spot it instantly when they can see it in three three dimensions they're almost blind to it um with the plans um which touches on the idea of digital twins for cities and everything else if we had all that data there we can easily identify the crime spots we can identify the areas that aren't properly lit or whatever else so much data is possible uh, and that can be embedded in the city also which i know is another podcast episode in itself probably no but, no, no 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 absolutely <laughs> i i avoid saying digital if people mention digital twins that's fine but and of course i'll link to where we've mentioned that on other episodes but just and for the benefit of people that again maybe new particularly to architecture the concept of placemaking now i wasn't familiar with that might be self-evident what it means but i don't know that it did to me originally can you just explain what you might mean by that and that is expanding to well, what you well, were saying i would argue yeah as a as an architect we we have a duty to our client to produce a very successful hopefully beautiful building but we are also making a permanent addition uh to the streetscape and to the city as a whole so uh when i say placemaking what, what what i mean really is is that um when you alter or build a building it fundamentally changes the nature of that place it either becomes uh more attractive uh safer more welcoming and uh it's increasing in value or the opposite you know i mean there are many examples of um experimental 60s architecture which didn't quite work the the goal was to create cities in the skies and, and beautiful um sunlit uh, uh apartments all facing uh the, the correct uh, orientation for the sun the reality was these walkways were very dangerous and and, and often uh, crime has become uh, almost impossible to eradicate in some of these these older buildings they didn't do it to you know they did it to, with, with good intention so um uh since then i think um architects are particularly careful now to try and really really make sure that every single contribution we make to a city or a, or a rural environment is respectful and will um enhance and improve uh, it, it more widely um so we're trying to do that but of course the client's only paying for our one building so we've got to try and um uh, not sell but um explain the benefits that uh, perhaps a particular approach to the design would offer uh, society as a whole so we, we're trying to wear several hats at the same at the same time does that make sense is that a good yes. way to describe oh, it oh, absolutely <laughs> yeah. thank you no 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 well i mean uh, you you know you know the best as well and you were alluding to the um not specifically i guess but you were describing what maybe is in retrospect, doesn't seem the best idea of a building. I know the brutalist architecture at Blackfriars in London, for example, is uh, 
which I've walked, <laughs> which I've cut through <laughs> several times, and then thought, oh dear. But uh, but again, again, it's things move on, don't they? The taste moves on, and uh, I know there is some brutalist architecture that's listed now, isn't it? Which obviously I love. I love brutalist yeah. architecture. I'm not. I'm. A, I'm a big fan. I love the UEA Barbican massive success. But you know, this is often um, uh, sort of a, a big sort of societal discussion as well. Um, um, certain types of housing uh, uh, work better in certain types of area and mass housing is incredibly successful in certain areas and, and less so in, in others. Um, using Norwich, my hometown, as an example, we need to get the density up a little bit. Um, uh, you go to um, France or Spain or wherever else and you think, wow, this is really busy. Everyone's out for pizza. Everyone's having a lovely time. Isn't everybody cultured? They just happen to live upstairs in the apartments. They're all right there. The density is up. The 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 taxis can run. The restaurants can uh, can exist because more people live in cities uh, that have a higher density. Um, and conurbations like like London obviously work, but for for smaller cities and towns, it's more problematic. Uh, everyone's there during the day, then they all go home and they they go, they go out out of the city afterwards. So um, how do we promote that and answer that question? Um, the buildings are already there. There are lots of uh, vacant stories above uh, shops on many of our high streets. So how do we convert those? Um, and this is where we drift back into BIM again. If we can create feasibility studies that make it easier to understand uh, how we can make adaptations to existing buildings, not only to make them more um, environmentally uh, uh, high performing uh, more energy efficient um but also to promote um the, the, their reuse so that you you might choose to uh move your family into the city for example uh which would then make the city more vibrant those kind of things so yeah we we cover a lot of things as architects and that's what it, why it's such a fascinating subject and i think technology is helping uh it's everything's joining up now it feels like there's a, a real golden age of um uh, software that is talking to other pieces of software and I think it's the humans that need to catch up a bit I think we're the ones that are behind I think the the technology is already here great thank you John you've uh, it's a perfect place to leave it and no doubt there will have to be a follow-on podcast because we started to get into we started to talk up my background as well as things like GIS so beyond the BIM like the, the the spatial strategies and all of that but that that'll be for another day but um thanks so much John Nortcliffe from uh, Redhead Architects we could keep going I definitely could and and I appreciate your time and insights anything we've mentioned uh, I'll link underneath uh, obviously to your website and uh, any other resources which I won't put you on the spot now but any other resources that John uh, wants to promote or link to I'll also put them underneath so thanks so much for your time John Norcliffe and uh, I hope we'll do a second podcast very soon but thanks again thanks again no that was brilliant thank you